Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3120, Transition to Advanced Mathematics for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldein. In lecture five, we want to talk about the notion of a complement and for sets and their counterpart in terms of logic, because we're seeing this nice duality between set theory and Boolean logic. It's kind of like a dyad for which is the fundamental of all mathematics here. Uh, for example, the notion of or represented in set theory as a union, but represented in logic as a disjunction and did similar between intersections and conjunctions there. Uh, we want to now get into the idea of not. What does not mean inside of both set theory and logic? We'll start with set theory first like we usually do. Now, as a reminder, when working with sets, it's sometimes necessary to discuss the idea of a universal set, which is often referred to as a U. When one is discussing uh, complements, it's almost a necessity. Um, there's one important exception, which we'll see by the end of this video here. So the universal set is then the set for which all the other sets live in. in. And this can change relative to the situation um, as illustrated by the example we see on the screen here. So if we're discussing um, searching for a book, I want to find a book for about such a thing, then it's probably implicit that your universal set is actually the collection of books in some type of library. This could be like a public library, a universe library, your personal library. Maybe this could be like a store you're going to buy a book from or just the internet itself. You're going to search the World Wide Web. You know, there's, there's some ideas, like you're not gonna search every book, you're gonna probably search, oh, I'm gonna look at the books that are in the SUU library. I need to find one about set theory or something like that. That's then your universe and you search amongst those. Um, let's say that um, we're trying to group friends, maybe Facebook friends, and I get how that could be a dated reference for some people watching it's like, Facebook is for millennials or whatever, you know, you, you know, it replace Facebook with whatever current social medium is exciting for the, the young folks these days or whatever. But let's say that you're trying to group friends on some, some Facebook like apparatus here. Maybe you have like a wedding that you want to invite people on. Well, in Facebook, the connections you have are called friends, but are they really friends, you know? Do, do I really want to invite them to my wedding or whatever? Um, so there, might, there be, might be some type of grouping there, like who gets an invitation, who doesn't get an invitation? Well, as you're trying to decide amongst these people who's invited and who's not, the universe will be your contacts on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, right? So there is that collection. You're only going to consider those who you already have a connection with. You're not just going to consider, oh, this random person, should I invite them or not? No, that's outside your universe there when it comes to contacts. Or a more mathematical one here, if we were working with a set of numbers, then that universal set is probably the natural numbers or the integers or the rational numbers or the real numbers or complex numbers. Those important sets of numbers we talked about before are typically the universe of numbers when it comes to specific math problems. So it's important that we have a universe in, 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 in our minds as we consider this problem of complement. So if A is a set, and then we think of it belonging to the universe there, A, um, a is a set, it's complement, and this is complement with an E, not complement with an I. It's not like, oh, oh, A, you're a really, you're a really great set. You take care of your kids, you're good at your job, you're so beautiful, not that type of complement. A complement would mean like a partner, um, you know, yin-yang situation here. Um, the complement of A, for which in our lecture series, we'll denote complements with a line over it, an overline there. This is not universal notation. Some people will use like a prime symbol. Some people use a superscript of a C, C for complement. Some people will use things like twiddle A or not A. Uh, there's, there's no universal notation for complements. And I can give you some reasons why that is a little bit later in this video here. But the complement of A is the set of all elements in the universal set that are not in A. So you want everything that's not an A. And that's why the universe is important here. Because if you're asking what's not an A, like what's wh what's the limit? Um, let's take, for example, the set A right here. The set 1, 2, 5, 7, 9. That's a set A. What's not in A? What's its complement? Well, the number 3 is not an A. 
the number 10 is not an A, the number pi is not an A, the number one plus I is not an A, the number Pikachu is not an A, right? Um, you have to realize that my social security number is not an A. Uh, what, wh wh how big is the complement? Depends on the universe. So for this example, our universe is the, is the natural numbers one through nine. And so the complement will be everything that's not an A. So as we go through this, notice one is an A, two is an A, but three isn't. So three belongs to the complement. Four belongs to the complement because it's not an A. Five is an A, so it's not in the complement. Um, six is not an A. Um, seven is an A. Eight is not an A. Nine is an A. So the complement of A with regard to this universe is three, four, six, and eight. Um, if we wanted to do the same thing for B, we grab everything in the universe that's not in B. So looking at these elements one by one by one, one is in B, so it's not in the complement. Two is in B, so it's not in the complement. Three is not in B, so it's in the complement. Four is in B, um, so it's not in the complement. Everything else, because that was the last element in B, then has to be in the complement. So we get three, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And so the complement is everything that is not in the given set. When you think of complements, I want you to think of the word not. Complement is just the set theoretic notion of not. Okay? Now, we have to have a universe, but sometimes you can get away with the universe not being explicit. And use this example to help us uh, understand that. Take a to be the set red, green, blue, and let B be the set red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, okay? These are both sets whose elements consist of colors. So if we didn't specify the universe, but it would be natural to think that the universe would be the set of all colors, right? And so there, of course, is some ambiguity there, right? Like, are we talking about the six colors of the rainbow? Some people try to argue there's a seventh one, indigo, and that's mostly just to make an acronym work. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, if you're like writing hexadecimal codes for colors, maybe you could have thousands of different colors in mind here. Uh, so just think of it as like the universal set is the set of all colors, right? Then we could ask ourselves, what is a complement? Well, we'd have to know every single color to be very clear about that. So we need more explicit universe in that situation. But what we could do is the following. We could ask, what does B intersect a complement? Now, be aware without specifying the universe, I can still define this set because what we're going to be looking for is we're looking for all colors X such that, and you know, this intersection means and here. So I need that X is in B and we need that X is in a complement. So that's what the intersection means here, but the complement means not. So we're looking for all colors such that X is in B and X is not in A. And so I can look at the things that are in B and I can just remove the things that are in A. Okay, so when you look at B, the color red is in B, but it's also in green, it's also in A. So that's not in A intersect a, a B intersect a complement. So we wouldn't include red. What about orange though? Orange is in B, but orange is not in A. So orange belongs to this set. Um, similar for yellow, yellow is in B, but it's not in A. Um, we could then look at green. Green is in A, so we won't consider that one. Blue is also in A, but purple isn't, or violet if you prefer. I guess some people consider those different colors. I will not get into that argument at this moment. Um, but So we get all the colors that are in B, but not in A. So in this case, in this very special case, we're able to introduce a complement without the universe, and we still were able to do this calculation. Because of this observation, this warrants a definition. And that definition is going to be what we call a set difference. So notice that in this previous example, B intersect A complement is a well-defined set of all elements that are from B but not in A. And we didn't need the universe to define that. And as such, this construction, B intersect A complement, is known as the set difference of the two sets, where it's the set where we take away everything from A Everything that was in A, we take it out of B. And then what's left over is the set difference.
No, the most common notation used for a set difference is something like this. You see like a B slash A, this downward slash. It goes from the top left to the bottom right. Um, sometimes people use the symbol B minus A, uh, and the minus makes sense given that it looks like a difference. And at this level, at the math 3120 level, this is probably the most common usage uh, for set differences, or if you're in a class before uh, transitions that talks about set differences, like for example, at SUU, there's Math 1030, Contemporary Mathematics. They do a little bit of set theory in that class. It's just like a general education math class for non-STEM uh, majors, but they get they get exposed to um, advanced mathematics a little bit in that class as well. Uh, they will probably do it this way. And the idea is minus means difference. And I assume the philosophy here is that we use a minus sign because this is a difference-like operation. And so we're like, oh, students will think of it as a difference we do that but in professional mathematics this is rarely ever used i can't say it's never used but it's rare this is like used the vast majority of the time and so as our goal is not to introduce you to, to, to new concepts the goal of this class is to transition you into advanced mathematics while that usually involves introducing you to new ideas there's more to it than that and so i say for our lecture series it's better that we just start using um, the more professional notation now instead of, you know, the more juvenile uh, notation because we're only going to use it for a short time before we transition anyways. So why as we'll do it now since that is literally the name of the class. All right. Um, another thing to mention here. So if we consider the previous example about the colors, red, green, blue, etc. Um, in that example, I do want to point out here that the set A was actually a subset of B. Because um, B had the six colors of the rainbow, and A just had red, green, and blue. And when you take the set difference, we were computing um, B take away A. You could go the other way around, though. You could ask, what is A take away B? Um, that would be, by definition, A intersect B complement, which if you calculate that, you would actually get the empty set. Now, in this situation, B is bigger than A by three elements. But what you get is you take everything that's in A that's not in B. Now, if A is a subset of B, there is nothing in A that's not in B because B is larger. And so you see this all the time. It turns out that when A is a subset of B, the symmetric difference, not the symmetric difference, sorry, that's something else. The set to difference, usually just called the difference. A take away B is then the empty set. That actually happens in both directions. And I'll let you prove that in the future at some point. So let's play around with this set difference a little bit. But before we do that, let's look at some other uh, let's look at some practice examples for unions and intersections that we've seen before, right? Um, so this time we're going to take some small animals, I guess, as our universal set. H is cat, dog, rabbit, mouse. F is dog, cow, duck, pig, rabbit. And W is duck, rabbit, deer, frog, mouse. What are these sets considering? Well, these animals. That's all we're going to say here. Um, so like we talked about unions and intersections before, uh, let's consider that right here. So if I take H intersect F union W, remember the parentheses take priority here. There's no order of operations for set oper for set algebra. So you have to follow the parentheses here. H intersect F here. So what that means is we look for all of the things that belong to both H and F. So when you look at these things, cat is an H but not an F. Dog is in H and F. So it's going to go inside the intersection there. Um, rabbit is in both H and F. Um, mouse is in H, but not F. And so anything else we didn't get already isn't in H. So that's all we have to consider. So the intersection is going to be dog and rabbit. Let's write that on the screen. And then we take the union of that with W, which the union just means we just put the two sets together. So we're going to have dog. We're going to have rabbit because those were in H intersect F. But then we also take everything from W. W has a duck. W has a rabbit. Well, you already have rabbit. We don't need to write it again. W has a deer. Um, w has a frog. Ribbit, ribbit. And it has a mouse. Squeak, squeak. And so that would be the calculation of that set right there. Nothing too fancy there. Um, but I do want to illustrate that if we switch the order of operations here, as in if we move the parentheses, if we take the union first and then the intersection, we do get something very different. Right, so if we now change the parentheses, we should take the union of F and W first. So we're going to get dog because that's an F, you're going to get cow, that's an F, you're going to get duck, you're going to get pig, you're going to get rabbit, 
I honestly can't say I know the sound that a rabbit makes. Anyways, um, with W, you're going to throw in duck. That's already in there. You're going to throw in rabbit. That's already in there. You're going to throw in deer. Don't have that one yet. Um, you're going to get frog. Frog's not in there yet. Or mouse. Pretty simple calculation. So that just gives us the union of the sets. Um, so now let's take the intersection between H and that. I can't see H anymore, so scooch it up a little bit. Um, so the intersection, H has a cat, but that set does not have a cat. Um, we do have a dog, um, we do have a rabbit, and we do have a mouse. So that's what's going to be our intersection there. So the intersection is dog, rabbit, and mouse. So, okay, we get a very different set. Notice the difference here. Order of operation matters. This also comes into play when we consider... Uh, compliments. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can see everything on one screen, even though my font is going to look super huge right now. So consider the set H intersect F complement intersect W. I want you to be aware this is the same thing as W set difference H intersect F like so. So we're taking the set difference. We want everything in W that's not in H intersect F. Those two sets are, these two sets are measuring the exact same thing here. Uh, again, order of operations. We do what's inside the parentheses first because there is no established order of operations for sets here. So we're going to take W, take away H intersect F, which we did that earlier, right? H intersect F was right here. It's going to be dog and rabbit. And so for the set difference, we are going to compute everything that's in W uh, that is not in that's neither dog or rabbit. So we can see W at the top of the screen. There's a duck. That's not dog or, dog or rabbit. There's a rabbit. That's, that's taken away. Deer. And frog. And mouse. So our objects can be colors, animals, numbers. It really doesn't matter. It's just about doing these types of calculations. Um, what does union intersection mean? And how does complements affect that? Uh, which in this case, we have this set difference, which does the same thing. Now that we've established these very important um, set operations, what I want to do now is actually establish some very important properties, algebraic properties, which we could call this like set algebra. You see similar properties like this when it comes to algebra for our real numbers. Things like addition is commutative, multiplication is associative, you have added and inverses, etc. Set algebra has similar type of properties. So if you have three sets, A, B, and C, that all belong to some universal set U, the following statements are true. Uh, the first property is known as the eigenpotency property, which says that if you take A union A, you get back A. So a set union itself doesn't give you anything new. Likewise, A intersect A is, is likewise A. If you take a set intersect with itself, you don't lose anything. It's still the original set A. Um, I, the identity property. The union operation has an identity element, and it's the empty set. A union the empty set gives you back A, because when you unite with the empty set, you don't gain anything new. So the set did not enlarge. Um, conversely, if you take A intersect the universe, you just get back A, because what this is asking for is you want everything in A and everything, right? Uh, you know, it's like, if you, you have to be an A and you have to be something, right? Then you're going to be an A. It's it, Intersecting with the universe doesn't restrict anything. So the universe acts like the intersection identity element. All right, so this is things we've seen before, like the number zero is the additive identity for real numbers. The number one is the multiplicative identity. Uh, but this eigenpotency principle is not something you see too often. With numbers, sure, you have things like zero times zero equals zero, um, one times one equals one. 0 plus 0 equals 0. These are eigenpotent conditions, um, but that's only true for 0 and 1. This statement says for any set, these eigenpotent properties happen. Also, we have absorption, okay? if you t This is kind of like the opposite of the identity. If you take A union the universe, you get back the universe, right? And if you take A intersect the empty set, you get back the empty set because um, there's nothing in here. There's no there's, So there's nothing in both. This contains everything, so if you join in things that were already there, you get back the whole universe. Um, if you use set differences there, um, A take away nothing gives you back A. So these are absorption properties in that respect. 
Um, speaking of set differences, there's what we call the complement property. The complement property tells us that if you take A union its complement, you always get back the universe. Because after all, you take things that are in A or not in A. Well, that's the only possibility. You're either in A or not A. You get everything back. Uh, conversely, if you take A intersect its complement, you get back the empty set. Um, also, if you take A subtract A, you get back nothing. Because you want everything that's in A that's but not in A. There's nothing that can do that. All right, uh, so this is kind of like an inverse axiom, um, but it's it's the the it, they're not inverses, they're complements. Because inverses combine together to give you the identities. Um, complements actually combine together to give you absorption, dominant elements. It's slightly different, but it is kind of related. Um, now let's get some axioms that you're probably familiar with. I shouldn't say axioms, these are properties of set algebra here. We can prove these things. Um, there's the commutative property. So A union B is the same thing as B union A. The order in which you unite things does not matter. Same thing with intersection. A intersect B is equal to B intersect A. The associative properties also hold. That is A union, the union of B and C, is the same thing as the union of A union B with C. Um, likewise, so you can move the parentheses around. So we're, uh, we're justified in not having parentheses when you have just combinations of unions. Same is also true for intersections. If you take A intersect the intersection of B and C, that is the same thing as the intersection of A intersect B with C. You can move the parentheses around there. We also have the distributive properties. Now the distributive property would be like for, a, for multiplication and addition would be something like two times three plus one. You can distribute the two, so you get two times three, plus two times one. Um, and now multiplication distributes over addition. What we have for, for the set operations is you have union distributes over intersections. So the, the A union B intersect C is the same thing as A union B intersect A union C, like so. So the union distributes there, but it also goes the other direction. Intersections distribute over unions. And, and so A intersect B union C is the same thing as A intersect B union A intersect C. And this is the very reason why we don't have a order of operations for set algebra. Because with real numbers, multiplication distributes over addition and that's where we get the priority. But for set operations, the distribution goes in both directions, unions and intersections. So either one is just as prioritized as the other. And then the last um, set algebraic law we're gonna mention here are known as the De Morgan laws and they have to do with complements. Um, if you have the complement of the intersection, so the complement of A intersect B, this is equal to the union of A complement and B complement. So complements turn intersections to unions. And then likewise, if you take the complement of A union B, this is the same thing as the complement of A intersect the complement of B. So De Morgan's law say that complements turn intersections to unions and unions to intersections. Now, many of these identities that we we saw on the screen a moment ago are fairly straightforward to prove, and many will be proven by you um, in the future. I'm not going to do them in this video right now is what I'm trying to say here. But to illustrate the basic template for proving that two sets are equal, we're going to prove the distributive laws. That's one of the harder ones on this list, given it's near the bottom. Now, these are algebraic properties of sets, but in the end, they are just sets. Okay, meaning that this set is equal to this set. We've talked about this before. To prove that two sets are equal, we will show that they are subsets of each other. So there's two directions that have to play here. Um, so I'm gonna choose this one right here and we're gonna prove that these two sets are equal to each other by showing they're subsets of each other. So to prove dis the distributive properties, we're gonna first show that A union B intersect C is a subset of A union B intersect A union C. Now, this is a common thing that people can do in proofs. You actually tell us what you're going to do uh, because it might not be clear to the reader, mostly because there's eight properties involved here. And then with each of these properties, there's just typically two identities. So it might, and then given an identity, there's two directions you have to go. So even though it's not mandatory, it is good practice to tell the reader what you're going to do when there might not be, it might not be clear what's the next thing to do. So it helps give the reader an expectation what's following. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prove this. A union B intersect C is a subset of A union B intersect A union C. Now to prove that this set is a subset of the other, we're gonna start with an arbitrary element over here and prove that it belongs to this set right here. 
So we take an arbitrary element of A union B intersect C. Well, a union means that X belongs to one of these two sets. It could be both, but it has to belong to at least one of them. So X belongs to the union either because X belongs to A or X belongs to B intersect C. Now you have two possibilities and I can't say it's one or the other. I don't have enough information because X is an arbitrary element and ABC are arbitrary sets. So I have to actually consider both possibilities. And so there's two cases and I'll just consider the two cases individually, starting with the first case. Um, if X belongs to A, so that gives us more information about X now because we have this extra assumption that if X belongs to A, well, consider the set A is a subset of A union B because A union B is everything in A or in B. Well, if you're in A, then you're in A, and so you're in A or B. So the union only enlarges the set there. Um, that's also true that A is a subset of A union C for the same reasons. Now, since X belongs to A, and these are two larger sets, this tells us that X belongs to A union B because it belongs to A, but also X belongs to A union C because it belongs to A. And since X is in both of them, it means that X is in the intersection between A union B and A union C. That's the direction we wanna go. So if X is in A, then it belongs, in the, to the, it belongs to the set we're trying to get. That was the first possibility. Well, the second possibility is that X belongs to B, B intersection C. Well, if X belongs to B intersect C, intersection is and. So I can actually say definitely if X is in B intersect C, then X belongs to B and X belongs to C. Now, since X belongs to B, you can enlarge B by looking at A union B, and therefore X belongs to A union B. Um, it's also true though, that since X belongs to C, that you can enlarge C to a bigger set. If X is in the small set, then X will have to be in the larger set. So X belongs to A union C. And so since X is in A union C and it's in A union B, that means X will belong to the intersection of A union B and A union C. That's the set we're looking for here. And so in the second case, we get inside the set. So in either case, we get that X belongs to this set. And so that shows us that the original set, which X was an arbitrary element of, uh, is contained inside the larger set. All right, let's go in the other direction. Now let's show that A union B intersect A union C is a subset of A union B intersect C. It's the same approach as before. We're gonna take an arbitrary element of the first set. We'll call it X. And so X belongs to A union B intersect A union C. Since this is an intersection, um, X belongs to both A union B and A union C. X belongs to A union B and X, union, uh, X belongs to A union C. Now, when we get to the union, so X belongs to A union B. I don't know if X belongs to A or B, so I have to consider the two possibilities. So if X belongs to A, right, then X will belong to any larger set, any superset of A, which it will belong to A union B intersect C, because this set does contain A, so X is in there as well. So we're done in that situation. Now, because so if X is if X is an A, then we know it's where it's supposed to be. Now, if X is not an A, because it's got to be one of those two situations. In logic, this is what you call a disjunctive syllogism. It's about an or statement. X is either an A or it's not an A. If it's an A, we're done. We, we proved it. So now let's consider the other possibility. X is not an A. Well, since X belongs to A union B, if it's not an A, then it has to be in B. But likewise, if since X belongs to A union C, if X is not an A, then it has to belong to C. So in this situation, we know that X belongs to B and we know that X belongs to C, which means that X belongs to B intersect C. Now, since X belongs to the intersection of B and C, it'll belong to any set that contains B union C, in particular, the union between A and B intersect C, like so. And so since X belongs to that, that's the set we're looking for. Um, and so in all possibilities, if X belongs to the first set, we then get it belongs to the other set, and that then shows the set containment. Since we showed containment in both directions, that implies the two sets are equal to each other, and that then establishes this identity, okay? 
Oh, so that was kind of a hard one for us at this point. Uh, I promise this will feel easier in the future, but for right now, this might feel overwhelming. Well, that's because we're still very much beginners in proving things, but I did illustrate some important points here. In particular, how do you prove that two sets are equal to each other? Show that they're subsets of one another. That is a template that we've already learned. Now, seven and eight are definitely the hardest ones on these lists, but try proving some of these earlier ones. Like, can you prove this identity using uh, the template we have for proving two sets are equal, or this one, or even this one. One through six are not anywhere as close to difficult as seven and eight. So I would encourage the, the viewer here to try to prove some of these identities to practice your set proving capacities.